Hi, and welcome to February and another month of episodes with Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. A few reminders, of course, don't forget to get your copy of the Tutors by Numbers, which you can now order right from my website, carolandloyd.com. I'd be very happy to sign and dedicate that book to you or the history lover in your life. And coming soon, I'm going to be having a cover reveal and some pre-publication news about my upcoming book, Courting the Virgin Queen. I also want to remind you, as it's February, and that's the month of Valentine's Day here in the U.S., we will be launching our first Royals and Rebels and Romantic ebook, and our first theme will be the top 10 lovers among the Royals, the Rebels, and the Romantics. So think about who you might choose among those top 10, and my patrons get to vote on the number one lover. So lots of exciting things happening this month, and I'm even more delighted to let you know we have another wonderful episode coming up right now. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited today to be here with Danielle Burton, who is the author of this great book that's not quite out yet. You can see on my version, yes, <laughs> on my Kindle, I could get a copy, but it, yeah. you know, it says when it will be delivered. But we are going to be talking about this, and I want to introduce you to Danielle. So welcome to Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. Great, thanks for having me. Well, I think this is going to be really fun because your research in this book is about someone that we sort of see, but we don't always give a lot of thought to. So I can't wait. But I want to start with a little bit more general question, which is how did you get interested in history in general? But then in this period of history, the Wars of the Roses and the Plantagenets and all of that, so what was your journey to this point? Um, so really, I've inherited it from my from my parents. So um, we live about an hour away from Bosworth Battlefield. Um, and so obviously, lots of trips to go and see a lot of the reenactments that they have on and things like that. That's really, you know, as a kid, it's really quite exciting seeing all the people all, you know, pretty much living in the medieval period as much as you can do in this day and age anyway. Um, so it's a bit of that. And um, we joined the Richard III Society when I was nine. Um, so it kind of, that this time period has always been in my life, really. Um, it's just, it's kind of grown from a um, sort of knowing about Richard III the most to, mm -hmm. you know, as you, you obviously from being nine to, you know, 20 years later, you end up adding, adding bits, don't you really? Um, so that's where it started. But um, I studied history um, at, at the University of Derby, which is my local university. Um, and that's kind of where my other periods of history that I quite enjoy um, came in, really. Well, that's great. So your family must be thrilled that you've taken that childhood interest and, you know, sort of turned it into your first book. So that's very exciting. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about how, so you've got the Richard III Society, so you joined as a family, is that right? Yes, yes, all, all three of us. I've been members for 20 years now, so yeah, okay. and try and uh, get others involved as much as possible. <laughs> okay, okay. So that's that's a broad, I mean, Richard's reign and all the people in it. So what brought you from that to Anthony Woodville? How did you kind of decide where you wanted to research and sort of pursue that interest? Yeah, so obviously knowing um, about Richard III's reign, you kind of know, I kind of knew about Anthony through his execution, which was right at the beginning of um, Richard III's tenure, really. Um, so that's kind of where I knew of him, is it was in that context to start off with, uh, was him being executed at Pontefract Castle. And then um, actually whilst I was at university, um, I know that we'd been and visited there when I was quite a lot younger, but I said, can we can we go back? 
you know, I was, you know, like I said, we do a lot of family history related trips. So <laughs> I was like, can we, can we go back? And they were like, yeah, okay, we'll go and do that. Um, so, so we did. And I noticed actually that a lot of their interpretation is very much built around the fact that Richard II died there, um, wow. which is great. And that's also a really important period of history um, as well. But I just thought, well, where's, you know, for the Cardians and, you know, the, the Wars of the Rosa period, Pontefract Castle is quite a substantial building in that time period. So I, I can remember asking some of the people that worked there, did they know much about, you know, Anthony Woodville's execution and everything there? I've never seen anybody look at me more blankly and went, who was that? And I was like, wow. the place where he died, that didn't feel right to me. So that's where my journey started in terms of, I thought, well, how can you not know who this person is? Because as you said, we all know kind of knowing the name, particularly as he's a Woodville, we know Uh the name, but we don't necessarily know details about him. So that's kind of what started me on this journey, actually, because I just thought, well, why don't they know who who he is? (laughs) Um, And that's what started the research, really. And, And I found a very interesting man that was more than how he died. Oh, that is really interesting to identify this place so associated with him, but people don't really, you know, that should be part of the story. We understand the other parts, but that certainly should be part of the story. Okay, so can you just sort of give us a history of who he was in the Woodville family? And um, just kind of give us a picture and then we'll start going specifically into him. But who are the Woodvilles? How did he and the rest of the family sort of come into the forefront of the Wars of the Roses story? Yeah, so we kind of know the Woodvilles mainly through um, Anthony's sister, Elizabeth Woodville, who went on to be the queen, the wife of Edward IV um, and all the issues that um, their marriage (laughs) ended up creating, really, as obviously um, we pretty much view them as kind of a peasant family that Edward saw Elizabeth on the roadside and oh that was it let's get married (laughs) Um, because we don't want other things happening Um, but really they're actually a lower gentry family is probably what we'd understand them as Um, so Anthony and Elizabeth's parents um, Richard and Jaquetta Woodville um, that's kind of really where you kind of start to understand what the Woodville family is really um, so Jaquetta was actually Jaquetta of Luxembourg and she was the widow of the Duke of Bedford. So quite a very high, you know, European princess status, really. Um, and after um, Bedford died, um, she fell in love with Richard Woodville, who has actually been part of Bedford's household, um, which kind of foreshadows the Elizabeth's later controversial marriage, actually. So it runs in the family. Really, so um, because of that, they probably have more status if you look at Jaquetta's connections, really. But um, Richard Woodville was he was a squire basically when they when they got married, and obviously had to promote him once he once he married Jaquetta. So really, they are lower gentry family, um, but they are quite um, a substantial family in Northamptonshire, where they their majority of their lands are, are based really um so they're not quite as common as muck as what well, I think some people might imagine they might be um but they're not obviously the status that um Edward the fourth should have been marrying into either okay so now Edward the fourth has been fighting for the throne and has taken the throne from the Lancastrians so as we're in this kind of battle of the wars of the roses let's just set out before the Edward Elizabeth meeting, mm. what side are the Woodvilles on? Because I do think that is important as the story unfolds. Yes, it is. So obviously, you uh, if people know of this marriage, you instantly expect them to have been Yorkist. <laughs> um, and actually, um, because of their connections with the Duke of Bedford, who was Lancastrian, um, that's where they started out at the beginning of, of the war, really. It was only when... Um, the Battle of Taunton happens and Edward wins this massive victory that um, they kind of co- concede really and they go, uh, I think we've we've lost a lot here. Um, so I think we better 
see how we how we deal with Edward um, on the Yorkist side. But actually, you know, once they turn Yorkist, they are Yorkist till the end. Right, and I I just think that's really interesting because we see people a little bit changing sides, um, and the mm. whole country really sort of has to change sides because Henry the Sixth is king, and then there are these battles, and then Edward's king. And then there are more battles and then Henry VI comes back. And so it's this time of chaos and changing sides. And I think that is a really interesting part of the whole story, um, this kind of chaos. And it's really hard to get power, but it's also so hard to hold on to power and position and all of that. Okay, so Elizabeth Woodville marries um, Edward, it was not an appropriate marriage, as you mentioned, um, and runs in the family. That's quite interesting because hers kind of goes the other way. Um, in Jaquetta's case, the woman really had the grand background and she sort of married down. In Elizabeth's case, I mean, there's no one higher than the king, so she really marries yeah. <laughs> up. So how does that affect Antony in particular and the rest of the family when this marriage happens? Well, of course, you can't deny that they benefited from that. There's no denying that, really. Um, but actually, we kind of, that's the beginnings of where you start to see that uh, idea of the Woodbills being a, a grasping family comes from. Because actually, weirdly enough, when Richard and Jaquetta got married, there wasn't actually much comment on the fact that Jaquetta had married quite a lot, you know, beneath her. But obviously, as soon as Elizabeth marries Edward, it's the talk of everything. <laughs> um, so actually, yes, of course, they did benefit from it. And there are various titles and roles given out that they probably would never have reached that level, you know, without marrying, you know, Elizabeth marrying Edward. But I kind of feel with actually with Anthony, he's not really given lots of titles and roles until actually um until the the heir comes along when the future edward v and um, edward prince of wales becomes born um and and anthony becomes the governor of him so the person in charge of everything to do with with the, the prince of wales uh, after 1473 uh, so actually for anthony it probably comes a lot later really i think he, in a way it's almost compared to some of the other ones that he's ended up having to prove himself a little bit a little bit more really but i mean he did there are examples of him doing that but he didn't necessarily benefit power wise until uh, much later right so i i wanted to mention that so that we can look at some of the things as you say almost seems like he's proving himself but he really has these extraordinary experiences on his own before he's sort of looped in to the royal household as it were so can you talk about i'm really intrigued by his relationship with William Caxton. I think that is really interesting. So talk to us about that. Yes, yeah, so um, like I said, he does have some involvement with um, with the Royal House, obviously, um, being mm -hmm. the brother-in-law to the king. Um, but um, really, it kind of, William Caxton's quite complicated because there is two instances that there is a possible that um, Anthony and Caxton first became involved with each other. Um, and nobody's really sure which example it is. So it's either when um, Edward's youngest sister, Margaret um, Margaret of York, goes and marries the future Duke of Burgundy, uh, Charles the Bold, because Anthony is actually the head of the marriage party, and he's also been part of the, the marriage negotiations as well. Um, so it's possibly when he went to Burgundy, escorting Margaret and it's actually at that point uh, when that marriage with Charles the Bold happens that William Caxton he was actually originally a merchant before he became the famous um, printer you know that he became later on so at that point he's actually um, the head of the merchant community out in Bruges so obviously marriage possession that everybody who was anybody in Bruges would have been involved in this marriage possession um, so it's a possibility that they'd have either met at that point or later on, um, like you've alluded to before, when um, Edward briefly um, has to go into exile when Henry VI is briefly restored. Um, so Antony, as well as people like the future Richard III um, and all, you know, this inner circle of Edward all have to go into exile and they do end up actually in Burgundy. 
Um, and that's that's the other possibility of how we started to meet Caxton, um, because they were actually hiding um, with um, a guy called Louis Lord of Crithus, who was one of the major landowners in in Bruges and was kind of you know a magnate, you know the kind of person who was represented of of the Duke, um, and they went and stayed with him in Bruges, and he's actually um, known to possibly have had the largest library in the whole of Europe. Um, and actually, Margaret herself had started to patronise Caxton in the early parts of his of his uh, printing career. So you can kind of see it's one or other of these um, that are, are entirely possible. But if not, it's definitely uh, possibly certainly a lot more likely that it's whilst out in out in exile, really, because that's when Caxton's already started to do his his printing, and that they're kind of really immersed in like I said this cult book culture that starts to evolve because we kind of have an image of you go straight from illuminated manuscripts straight to the printing press when actually the both both of them coincided quite quite well um in this you know in the very early stages of the printing press that you probably would still have presentation copies um in which um the first one that Anthony Woodville actually translated and William Caxton printed for him um, it's called the Dixon Sayings of the Philosophers, which is kind of a lot of moral sayings and things from ancient Roman and Greek philosophers. Um, we, that's the, actually the only image that we have contemporary of Anthony Woodville is from the illuminated manuscript version of that, in which he presents the co copy to Edward IV. Um, so I think there's quite a few um, interesting things to glean from that. Right. And one of them that you just mentioned is that he is with Edward IV and Richard, who becomes Richard III, that they are part of that group that has to flee when Henry VI comes into power. So he is part of that inner circle that's, you know, following Edward um, yeah. as he rebuilds and then comes to take the throne back. And so um, the idea is you really had to be um an efficient knight and fighter and uh, warrior to survive if you were going to be at that level of mm -hmm. government where you're with someone who is claiming to be the king and there is someone else claiming to be the king you better be prepared to fight so what do we know and i know it comes up later when he's mm -hmm. with the young prince but what do we know about antony and his you know, tournaments or his his skill as a warrior, as a, as someone who could defend the king and fight for the cause. Okay, so actually, um, we don't see Anthony himself at a lot of the major battles of the Wars of the Roses, actually, because he's usually busy looking after something else. <laughs> um, so, uh, like I say, he was definitely at Towton. That was the first instance that we know he definitely was at. As um, he was actually mistakenly. Um, thought to have been among the dead, but luckily he wasn't, thank goodness. Um, uh, which is understandable with the amount of deaths um, that they were, because obviously Towton was the bloodiest battle to have been fought on, on English soil. So it's kind of understandable that people might have been misidentified, etc., etc. Um, So that's the first instance that we have of his kind of military um, skills coming to the fore, really. Um, so I said he wasn't actually at a lot of... Um, the prominent battles that we we imagine to do with the Wars of the Roses, but actually not long after, a year after Towton, he's asked um, to go and help fight in Northumberland. Um, so after Towton, the Lancastrians have moved north um, and obviously um, Northumberland is along the border of the Scottish border who, who um, quite often uh, ended up helping the Lancastrian cause really um so Anthony is asked to go and help with the the besieging of the castles there um and that's kind of seen as his first instance of kind of proving himself for the Yorkist cause really it goes disastrously wrong nothing to do with Anthony they decide to do it in the middle of winter and they all freeze freeze everything off to be honest that's why it didn't work very well um so there are glimmers of that in the early stages, really. Um, and then the other one that we know we definitely fought out was actually the Battle of Barnet, which is the famous battle in the fog that um, the Earl of Warwick, the, uh, the Woodville's actually main rival, um, was killed at. 
Um, so he, he was actually injured that in that battle along with Richard Duke of Gloucester as well. Um, so there are actual instances that we know that he definitely fought. But like I said, compared to somebody like probably Richard, um, Richard was at quite a lot of the major battles. Um, so actually, he um, Anthony's skills were more prominent on the um, on the jousting tournament scene, really. Um, it's all very nice tale stuff, to be honest. <laughs> really, really is. Um, so actually, um, tournaments are actually quite a family thing. So we know that Richard Woodville, uh, Anthony's father, definitely did jousting, and um, so did. Anthony's brothers, John and Edward, um, they they actually all all of them were quite renowned for their for their jousting prowess, really, and they're all kind of tournament champions. Um, but Anthony seems to have been the one that most people remember, um, because he had quite flamboyant tournaments, basically. It, like I said, it really is a nice tale stuff. So um the most famous one that he fought was actually the the tournament at Smithfield, which was actually fought against Antoine the Bastard of Burgundy, who was Charles the Bold's legitimate brother. Um, so that was kind of fought in the um kind of you know, around that that uh, those um circumstances of Margaret of York's marriage. It's all kind of um kind of diplomacy around that, really. Um so it's kind of it's military style used but also diplomacy, um, but it didn't quite go to plan <laughs> to be honest um so what happened was you know like that it's all meant to be diplomatic they're all meant to be fighting each other but not not to kill um and then it so happens that um the bastard of burgundy actually accused anthony of cheating because something had happened and then anthony was like whoa 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 no i didn't N nothing happened here um we can't tell 100% yes or no, it did happen. But um, from what I've I've noticed, actually, the Bastard Burgundy was the victim of cheating from other people. So I think he had a little bit of a hang up, <laughs> really. Um, so obviously, it was kind of um, said, right, we'll, uh, we'll get rid of the horseback because um, these tournaments were not just about horseback and lance skills that like we kind of imagine they'd have used all sorts of different weapons. So you'd have that as well as um, your hand-to-hand combat with various swords and axes and other weapons, etc. And that's actually what happened. They said, right, okay, we'll stop the horseback. We'll be back tomorrow and do all of the hand-to-hand. And then um, it got very heated, <laughs> as you can imagine, with all of these accusations flying. And um, Edwards had to get the heralds to intervene so uh, people didn't get, um, neither of them got, um, as you know, too hurt, basically. But um, that particular tournament got cut short as um, the Duke of the Duke of Burgundy actually died um at that point, and then Charles did actually the bold did become the Duke of Burgundy um at that point. So um, yes, it's all had to get cut short thanks to that. But um, you know, he's got all of these skills really, and I think a bit a bit of flamboyancy. <laughs> mixed in um right. as well but um yeah and that's really fun to think about because as you say we often think of these tournaments being what is recreated at renaissance fairs which mm -hmm. is horses and lances and spearing a ring or something like that but they were ways initially of showing off some of the real military skills and you can imagine that they could get heated, even if they were supposed to be all diplomatic, you know, words yeah. get thrown, whatever. But he does, he does sort of stand out in that. So we have him fighting alongside the the king and Richard Duke of Gloucester in a couple of situations, and then we have him in these tournaments. So we have this sort of military side of him or these these skills, but it's a very religious time as well. So what do yeah. we know about his religious um, feelings or, or actions? I guess we don't really know feelings, but what about his religious yeah. actions? Or what do we see there? Um, so actually, we see that he was, um, actually, he was a pilgrim 
for quite in a few different circumstances. So we know that he definitely went to quite a few pilgrimages in, in England, um, particularly um, Walsingham was quite a popular one. And we know that he again visited there um, with Edward and, and Richard as well. Um, so that's a documented one. We know that he probably would have gone to Canterbury as well as that's one of the other, um, you know, quite important pilgrimages to make in England. Um, but we also know that he did um, to um, quite to us, you think, how on earth would they have managed it logistically in their day? Because obviously, you know, most pilgrimages um, would have been, like I said, conducted in whatever country anybody was living in. Um, but just because transport and things like that were nowhere near as sophisticated as what they are now and certainly roads are pretty much no more than dirt tracks really so um and so actually you kind of get a sense of well pilgrimages would have been for anybody from if you were actually given permission as you know a peasant working on a, on you know for the lord of the manor if the lord of the manor gave you permission you could go so it would have been um you know like i said if it was one in the in in the same countries somebody lived in it could be anybody of any class could have gone as long as you know they they were able to um but anthony like i said he actually took uh, part in some abroad so we we know he um he definitely went to santiago de compostela which is where saint james is in spain um so actually like i said think of that logistically in their time that would have only really been possible for somebody possibly like anthony who would have been you know nobility would have been able to afford to travel um probably would have at least probably had some servant at least to go to go with him um so you know they're quite strenuous journeys you know it's not like us now where you can literally just pop on a plane you know it's nowhere near that easy <laughs> Um, so he would have actually had to travel through a lot of different pilgrimage sites in in um, France before he got, you know, on his way, on his way to Spain. Um, but that one in particular is actually quite poignant because we think he um, he wanted to talk about a particular one in memory of his mother Jacetta, who had died the year before. Um, but actually, his first wife Elizabeth Scales died back in England during the time when he was on on the pilgrimage to Santiago. Um, which he probably, obviously, I assume, I, I, we don't know whether we'd have known that whilst he was on pilgrimage, whether that would have been an information he'd only know when he got back. I don't, you know, we don't know. Um, but actually, that one um, is also poignant in terms of his journey with Caxton, actually, as um, whilst on this journey, he befriended or talked to at least um, a Frenchman on his way. And he gave him um, a text in French that actually was the French version of the Dixon saying and of the philosophers that he later translated. Um, so actually, that's quite an important pilgrimage in terms of what he would do later on as well. And I think there's that exchange of knowledge of terms of um, they'd have been meeting all sorts of people on the way of the, you know, on, during their journeys for these pilgrimages. So that's that one's quite important. And we do know um, that he also made pilgrimage to Rome as well um which again logistically is quite difficult to do and uh, but we do know that um for that one in particular that edward gave him like letters of passage so that people would know who he was and you know he wouldn't get uh, anybody hassling him along the way so a bit like a passport really um but he didn't get hassled um he actually got robbed <laughs> robbed on the way of um because um they he did taken which as it explains um with this one that he'd have taken a lot of plate and things to give his offerings um along the way um so yes he had a lot of um silver plate and things um stolen from him and there was a lot of letters um trying to track down where all of his um his stuff had gone because actually he wasn't that far away from rome um so he was nearly there <laughs> and he got <laughs> robbed um but they actually managed to track his stuff down to to venice <laughs> so yes um so quite eventful, eventful journeys there. But um, actually, um, Anthony himself had quite a personal affiliation with the Virgin Mary as well. So we know that um, he actually was a patron 
of um, a chapel um, called the Lady of Pew in Westminster, which was actually, um, it was a chapel dedicated to the Virgin Mary that actually had suffered a fire. And it was in within the precincts of um, the Abbey and the Palace of Westminster. Um, so it had suffered a fire, but actually they uh, rebuilt thanks to Anthony's patronage. Well, you could see, and, and I love these stories because they demonstrate a very active faith. So he's mm. going and, and those, I'm so glad you mentioned the journey to the pilgrimage, the, the time you would spend getting there and mm. how difficult and dangerous, even with that passage, he still got robbed, yeah. you know, <laughs> it could be very difficult, very dangerous. He's going out of the country. So he's going on some fairly deeply costly um, journeys as a pilgrim, you know, he's making these pilgrimages, which do show a devotion or a, these faithful actions that he's yeah. undertaking. And it's also interesting, the ones in England, where you mentioned he's going with the king or he's going with Richard of Gloucester, he is again, being seen as part of that family, whatever happens later, yeah. he is part of that family in those times. And I think because the story is so dramatic, um, sometimes we skip over the part of the family stuff, which you're sharing with us. Yeah, I think I, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's really interesting um, to see him with the family doing these difficult, doing a pilgrimage, you know, mm -hmm. fighting alongside, participating in these tournaments, that he was really an integrated and active part of the family. So he is eventually appointed as the governor of the Prince of Wales. So what does that mean exactly? Um, so basically, um, initially, when it's, you know, because really they haven't, Edward's got to kind of think, right, okay, now we have an heir, because um, if they'd waited a good 10 years or so, roughly, to have to have them. Um, to have a boy, him, uh, Elizabeth and Edward. Um, so he's got to find his, you know, what do we do? <laughs> um, you know, he's not, you know, he's not necessarily, because obviously he was um, the son of a duke before he became king. So he's like, okay, what do we do here? You know, it's not something that he'd have necessarily, you know, he wasn't brought up to be king. Right. So he's like, um, how do we grow a king, basically? <laughs> is That's that's his question. Um so initially, you do kind of have a council around around him that obviously involves Elizabeth, Woodville, uh, Richard Duke of Gloucester, and all that sort of thing, and then Anthony as well, trying to figure out what what do we do, what do we do, you know. Um, and eventually, what is decided is that you know the council was reduced. There was still some form of council, and you know it was also a lot of. Um, people from the Edwards household, people that would be trusted to kind of know what, what are the next steps, really. Um, if, if Edward, you know, the, this Prince of Wales is going to become the future Edward V, you know, we, you, you know, you've just had a case of, you know, civil war for quite a long time. You know, we need to future-proof our dynasty, really, is, is, is what, that's kind of what everybody's thinking, really. Um, so what happens is that it's decided that that um, they should um, set up a separate household um, for him, and it ends up being in Ludlow, uh, which is um, in the Welsh Marches. Um, and I assume that's kind of not only is that because um, Ludlow itself and a lot of the Welsh Marches were once the responsibility of the Mortimers, who were um, ancestors of Edward, um anyway um but it's also kind of it's possibly seen as a, two two different things really a mixture of a safe haven in terms of you know if there's any more problems you know around london or elsewhere it's kind of a bit out of the way so there's the safety aspect and also like i said the continuation of of um familial ties there but it's also a case of um but it's a place to show power um, because the council of the marches was also part of part of this. So you're also saying, right, okay, we're gonna have a seat of power that's centered around this Prince of Wales, 
really. So there's there's quite a few different things going off there. Um, so um, you know, after a few good few years of that, that um, Anthony's placed as governor of the household, which basically means he's the one in charge of everything to do with Prince of Wales. So um, Edward IV actually writes a list of things that must happen, you know, how how the prince must be looked after, what his education is going to be like. Um, and really, I think from, from that, it shows that he's like, I don't want him to end up like me, that, you know, overeating, um, womanising, uh, probably a bit not that bothered about religion. We need somebody who's going to be a good multifaceted um person you know because obviously like i said edward the fourth was you know his education would have been the son of a duke not necessarily king as he ended up being later on so he's got to have you know uh the next level education um so and obviously really it kind of shows how multifaceted the education would have been so it would have been things like sport probably dancing as well as obviously your um you know, you need your military skills in that as well. And obviously your book learning. I mean, Anthony, he's very good at doing quite a lot of those things. So I kind of feel like, yes, of course, you've probably got this job as being uh, the brother-in-law of Edward IV, you know, the uncle to this young prince. But I kind of feel very much that he's gone, well, who kind of ticks those boxes to make sure those things are, are going to happen, you know, and who's, who, you know, who's responsible enough? Because, you know, it's a very big responsibility to make sure that, um, you know, this young prince is staying safe whilst also, you know, you know, ticking off his education, really. So that's where Anthony comes in. I think, you know, like I said, he's the best person, really, that, that fits all of those things at once. Because really, we think... You kind of look at it in its basicness that um yeah, it's a very renaissance much later style education that you might possibly think so actually really i think you can say it probably would have been uh, a very early renaissance type education which i don't think you necessarily understand because you kind of feel like to us you kind of say when you say renaissance education you almost imagine henry the eighth being the the first renaissance um you know, prince, really. But actually, maybe there's a bit of that coming in already at this point. Yes, because they had, after all these wars and turnovers and, and battles, things had settled down a bit. The second time Edward mm -hmm. takes the throne, things yes. had settled down. And so now's the time to prepare for the future. As you say, let's get the dynasty strong and prepare for the future. Yeah. And that was a huge responsibility for Anthony Woodville. And I think you're right. I think the idea of the combination of the military and the religious and, you know, this interest in Caxton and translation and some of that, it's not yet a fully humanist education, but there are elements that are coming yeah. in of the scholarship and the valuing of that scholarship. So it was a really great opportunity for Anthony Woodville, but he was really prepared and as far as my research, and you've researched this more, I didn't see anybody objecting to him or saying, no, he's not prepared for this. Everybody seemed to be, oh yeah, that's the right person to raise up because, you know, this is a way yeah. to support. He's not being really brought up by his father. So Edward, young Edward is being sort of raised up by Anthony Woodville. Okay. So that's going on. Things are happening in London. Edward V, unfortunately, is overeating and overindulging and all kinds of things. So we get to the point of the story where Edward IV dies. And then everything starts to change. And that's, you know, it was an unexpected death. He wasn't mm -hmm. in great health, but certainly he was so young and, you know, he'd been so successful in battle. I, I think his death came to a lot of people as a surprise, but he did yeah. realize uh, at least a few days before. So he set up a will that said what should happen because his son, the prince was only 12. Yeah. So tell us what happens then, because now we've really met Anthony and we know what he's been doing and why he was chosen and given this incredibly important position. So what happens when the king dies? So as you can imagine, um, everything 
just went out the window, <laughs> as you can imagine, you know, because um, it's not that long ago um, that you've got the tumultuous reign of, of um, Henry VI, who actually came to, to the throne as a child and then ended up with possibly a lot of mental health difficulties that meant that Edward was able to become to become king. And then obviously not also, again, not long before that, well, within about 100 years of or so, probably a bit less than that of, of, of this, um, you've got Richard II coming to the throne as well as a young child. Um, and as you, as, as you might imagine, Neither of those instances ended very happily. They don't end well, yeah. <laughs> this no, is not a good precedent. No. <laughs> no, so I can imagine that it would have been a time of fear and uncertainty when it was hoped that perhaps, you know, the Wars of the Roses had kind of at least died down by this point. We don't want to go back to years and years of, of war because, you know, and obviously the other, the other problem is that if, and you do have a, a boy king, there's instances for people to abuse that, which is particularly what started off a lot of the issues with, with um, Henry VI, definitely, that that's, that's kind of um, fueled a lot of the beginning of the, of the Wars of the Roses was accusations of, of false ministers um, behind behind Henry VI. So I think there's a lot, there'll be a lot of fear that, you know, I was, you know, that, the stability that everybody, their country had craved is now now at risk again. So I can understand that there would have been a lot of what do we do to for the best in, you know, in what even must have been a very awkward, difficult situation. Um, but as you say, we we believe that Edward had said um that Richard, the who was Duke of Gloucester, could who was obviously the boy king's uh, paternal uncle um, could be Lord Protector. But um, from my research, I've seen that actually there was actually quite a lot of discussion of which what's going to be best in this situation. Would it be best to rule with some one person in charge or would it be better to rule with some form of council? Um, you know, which which option is going to be best? I, I mean, really, I can understand, obviously, it's probably going to be one of those two options anyway. So obviously there's, there's discussion as to as to what would would be best, although um, we believe that that's what Edward had asked for, that it would be um, Richard as Lord Protector. Um, but actually, you know, it didn't entirely at that point rule out a possibility of a council, maybe, um, which I suppose would be understandable, really, considering the, the situation and that, you know, really. Um, but I kind of feel like if there actually had have been that as an option as, as, as a council I think really Anthony proved himself he would probably be the, a good person to have on that council because that's pretty much what he'd already been doing with the Prince of Wales and um, as he was the, the person who would have been most in, in, in um, Edward's life really because he didn't really have much contact with the rest of his family other than for holidays and you know things really because effectively he was in a form of boarding school really I suppose is what we'd understand in our understanding anyway um so I think he would have been a good person to have on board for a council because he'd already got um, this relationship with the boy king and also like I said, he's, he's proved himself in multi facets of things anyway. Um, so that could have been a, a possibility. Um, but the, the issue was that um, it took quite a while for news to reach Ludlow that Edward IV had died. Um, and this is when things start to get a little bit what did and didn't happen really um as they also um it took them quite a while to actually leave Ludlow because obviously they had to then move towards London ready for um proclaiming you know after he's been proclaimed king to you know to the coronation um so they actually took a while to leave and they didn't leave until after after this so we think that there's a possibility that they stayed in Ludlow to celebrate St George's Day because obviously again um you know that you know patron saint of England of course it's a very very important saint today um so that that's entirely a possibility um but there's actually quite open discussion about the fact that obviously you need some form of armed guard for this young king to transport him to, to London and there actually is discussion as to how you know what what number of armed men they're going to take with them. 
And I think the kind of agreement is that it's possibly that they, uh, uh, you know, compromise on 2,000 men, which is quite a lot, but obviously, understandably, you need a, a large armed guard. Um, but I kind of feel like, well, if that's the compromise that was reached, still at that point, there wasn't even too much um, going off that could be bad at that point, if this, that's the compromise that's, that's been made. Um, so it does sound as if there is... Um, because you also have this other problem is in terms of um, Richard Duke of Gloucester. He's uh, basically the Lord of the North, as it were. So he's in his northern lands. So he's also got to be like, OK, right, OK, now I need to get to London as well. And, you know, all of this going off. So there is an agreement that they should meet up, meet on the road um, at that point. Um, but actually, I don't, there is, again, a case of where should they meet and everything Um and they agree on, on Northampton. Um, and so the legend goes, it was moved from Northampton and they, um, the Ludlow household ended up moving to Stony Stratford, which is actually quite a small uh, place outside of Northampton. And the excuse is uh, that's supposedly given for that is that um, there's not enough room at the inn in Northampton, which is quite a large town because it's quite well known for, for shoemaking and, and things like that. So it's quite a, you know, as much as industrial as you can get in medieval medieval times. So, you know, they'd have had places to stay, um, but that's the excuse that's uh, um, apparently given as to why a lot of the household end up moving with the, with the king to Stony Stratford. Um, but actually, um, Annette Carson has actually put forward quite an interesting proposal, which I think is quite, I think it makes sense. That actually, like I said, the, the Woodfields, um, Northamptonshire is their, um, their heartlands and their main house of Grafton isn't that far from, from Northampton and Stony Stratford. So is it a case of that's actually where they put up the king and that would have been seen as the, a bit of a flashpoint as, you know, um, keeping the king in, you know, in Woodville, um, with Woodville security in that way. Although, um, I suppose on from the other side, you could also say, well, actually, that's a way of keeping him safe as well. So, yes, uh, a bit of issues uh, or not issues there, depending on which which viewpoint that you 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 have really. Um, and actually, even at that point. Um, uh, Anthony and um, it's argued a little bit as to whether uh, Richard Gray, who was Elizabeth's second oldest son from her first marriage, um, he was also involved with the, the Ludlow household. So it's argued whether Anthony and Richard were um, together and they stayed at Northampton, or whether it was just Anthony on his own um, to meet up with Richard Duke of Gloucester as as arranged. And they actually, uh, whichever, whether it was Anthony alone or Anthony and Richard Gray, um, they met with the Duke of Gloucester perfectly okay. They met as friends, as we've, we said before. They were together in in Edward's circle and they, they quite, I wouldn't say friends necessarily per se, because there's no evidence of that, but certainly not um, cloak and dagger with each other, definitely not. Um, and only a month before all of this, um, there was actually... Um, the hope of um, some legal um, wranglings with each other, so you know, help with with legal issues. So actually, the, there was no, not necessarily an immediate sign that there was anything wrong, really. So they sat in, at dinner together and everything, and then it was only the next morning that things had changed and arrests were made, um, and all of these men that had suddenly been, you know, around the king were suddenly dismissed. Um, and uh, so there's um, the whole idea is that it was possibly a, well, you know it was argued that they were involved in a Woodville plot to take over and that was the reasons for this the, these arrests but um, as far as I've seen if there's not really an evidence of if there was one because they said that there was weapons found with the Woodville coat of arms on um, from what I've noticed really Anthony was out of the way in Ludlow and not really, you know, finding himself a little bit. So I kind of feel like if there was a Woodville plot, he either wasn't involved or they didn't tell him enough, um, really. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of feel like he was actually quite scapegoated, really, um, if there was one. But it also I also find it very intriguing that um, the Duke of Buckingham, who had actually been excluded from power under Edward IV, um, 
who managed to ingratiate himself with Richard Duke of Gloucester. Um, it all changed all of all of the atmosphere after the Duke of Buckingham arrived, and he was not a fan of the Woodvilles. So that was a possibility. That there's a little bit of um, whisperings going on as well. Yeah. So, which kind of it's you know, if that is the case, what a new opportunity to start doing that in terms of a new regime change. Right, that's the time to move in, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not yet yeah. established. And you're right. So we have this young king which automatically that makes him vulnerable and potentially makes the nation vulnerable yeah. and so there needs to be this shoring up of support and bringing together but in fact at this you know whatever happened between dinner and the next day mm -hmm. something changed so yeah anthony and um elizabeth's son were both arrested correct Yes, along um, along with Thomas Vaughan, who was actually the Chamberlain yes. of of the the young prince as well. So they would have these would have been people who were close to young Edward, and were yes were taken arrested right there. Is that correct? Like yes. in the morning. Okay. Okay. Can you tell us what that might have been like? I mean, imagine all of that going on. Where had they all spent the night. Had Anthony Woodville gone back to be with Edward, young Edward, overnight, or, yeah. or where was everybody? Now, as far as we know, they, the, um, Anthony, and like I said, if he was with with Richard Gray, they Richard definitely Gray. stayed in Northampton. So this is literally, I can't. There's um, there's some kind of imaginings of literally in their night clothes being dragged dragged away, kind of image, really. Um. Uh, yes, but um, actually, um, Richard Vaughan was definitely with the prince. Um, so as obviously as his chamberlain, so he was his closest, um, closest servant really. And actually, he'd he'd known him since a child. He'd carried he'd carried um, Prince Edward when um, Louis Lord of Carthage was invited over um, after Edward was restored, because the prince Edward had actually been born whilst Edward was in exile. Uh, once everything was restored, um, he invited Louis Lord of Carthage over to say, thank you, you saved our lives, basically. So there's a lot of pageantry over that, but actually Thomas Vaughan carried little baby Prince Edward during a lot of, a lot of that. So um, it's at this point that I think, gosh, whatever has happened, whether it really is a plot or not, He's still got a 12 year old boy who's had the people that he's known the most. And actually, they're probably more like father figures to him than his own father was, suddenly ripped from him. I kind right. of, I can't help but kind of feel like, gosh, how much of that have felt for him? Because it's, it must have been hard enough to suddenly go, right, you, you're king now, your dad's just died. <laughs> and then suddenly you're having the people who are the closest other than your father taken from you I think that must have been quite hard you know when it's it must have been tough to tell but tell a 12 year old you're, you're king now enough as it is although obviously as much as obviously he was uh, you know they would have been seen almost as an adult not quite but almost in a, more of an adult than perhaps we'd see a 12 year old now um but you still think well regardless that's a big situation to suddenly throw somebody into at whatever age, let alone at 12. Yeah, so, so much has changed for him. And the thing that's been constant is those few people in his life. So now you're leaving Ludlow, where you've been, your home, where you're really comfortable. You're mm -hmm. on your way to London with these people you know, but now you're on your way not to see your father the king, but to be the king. So things are yeah. already changing so much and then they're taken away. So what happens to let's stay with Anthony for a minute and then we'll go back and rejoin Edward. So what yeah. happens to Anthony when he is arrested and, and prevented from seeing young Edward again? Okay, so um, the three men that are arrested, Anthony, Richard Gray and Thomas Vaughan, they are all actually taken to separate places in, um, in Richard's heartlands in, in the north. Um, so they're all placed at various different spots, but Anthony himself was actually... Um, imprisoned initially at Sheriff Hutton, um, which uh, well, had been, 
you know, like I said, it was part of, of Richard's lands. Um, so he would, they were all separated as well, which does suggest that obviously they might not want people talking to them or to them talking to each other, whatever. Um, so I think that must have been probably quite a lonely experience. Very confusing, confusing time, really. Um, so we do, we do know that um, actually from when they were arrested in, in April, that actually nothing's done with them yet. They're left where they are, which to me suggests perhaps it might not be quite as emergency as you'd have thought if they're, <laughs> nothing's done straight away. Or whether there's some investigating going on, we don't, we don't, you know, we can't know that, you know, in this passage of time. Um, but like I said, nothing is done immediately. So, you know, it's not like it had been put in a dungeon. <laughs> so they're still kind of treated like um, the gentlemen that they were. But, you know, they they were still in prison. Um, but um, we do know that Anthony actually carried on um, writing um, whilst in prison. So he actually wrote a final poem that has survived, which is, um, it's quite complicated, but the whole gist is the idea of the Wheel of Fortune turning always, not necessarily in the in the way that you might want it to, um, which is actually quite depressing because he's pretty much saying in the end, I welcome death, that's probably what's going to happen, which is, yeah, you know, that, that obviously must have been in their, in, in their minds. Right, once, what you're, happened. once you're arrested and left behind and you no longer have the king, the, the young king, um, it, yeah, he must have been very concerned. You're separated from everybody else, you're on your own, even if you're still treated like a noble, you're still imprisoned, not in a dungeon, but you still can't just get on your horse and ride away. So yeah. it must have, he's sensing that this is really going badly. So meanwhile, young Edward is taken into London, but not with Antony as planned now he, and, and Richard and, and that group, but now he's with Richard yeah. and Buckingham and yeah. they take him into London. So yeah. how long... Does Anthony stay in prison before he's executed? And what, I, I'm sorry if that was a little spoiler alert for anybody. Um, and what what is the charge? I mean, how is that then processed? And do we know, does he know what's happening meanwhile in London when he's, you know, communication is just more difficult. He can't pull out his phone and see what's happening on, you know, the news yeah. app or whatever. So does he know what's happening? We may not even know that. Do we know that? Yeah, that's that's the bit that we don't really know how much he would have known as to what was, you know, going off in London and, you know, whether or not he knew that there were sort of still plans for a coronation at this point. I don't, and we're not really totally sure, but then we're also not sure. There's some sources that say yes, there's other sources that say no, that whether they had a trial. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a, that's a whole other issue, whether they had one or, or, or not, really. Um, because there's some sources that say, yes, they do, and then they argue as to whether who was in charge of this, whether it was the Earl of Northumberland, who was basically the person put in charge of the North after, you know, Richard obviously ended up having to go to London. And then other people say, well, yes, it was, but it might have been William Catesby or Richard Ratcliffe, who were um, some of uh, other notable men of, of Richard's. Um, but actually, that would that would make sense, and um, you know, they were from a kind of lawyer background. I'm sorry, suddenly there's a giant spider there. Sorry. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So there's uh, there's arguments as to whether or not there was this this trial that held for them or not, um, which obviously would have been the confirming that there was a Woodville a Woodville plot, basically. So that's kind of whether they had a trial, uh, you know, trial or not, that's basically what they're charged with is, is plotting, basically. All right. So they're charged with plotting and they're found guilty or yeah. they're just found guilty. If there was a trial, they're charged and found yes. guilty. Otherwise, they're yeah. ultimately found guilty. <laughs> and are, are they still all separate or are the three of them um, brought back together at any point? Yes, so they actually all three of them are brought to um, Pontifact Castle once, once you know, there's no uh, getting out of the fact that they're going to be executed. Okay, all right. So tell us about the execution and can you give us the date so we kind of get the sense yes. of how quickly 
this moves. Yes, so they were arrested in April of 1483, and they are executed on the 25th of June. Uh, in, so, yeah, you know, a few, a good few months. So actually, like I said, at the same point, it's quite quickly, but at the same point, not instant either. So, right. yeah. So it doesn't seem to be an emergency. Like, oh, no, there's a there's a some kind of plot going on. Grab them and put them in trial. You know, so there's that. So. What is happening in London while this happens up north at Pontefract? So what is May like in London? What is June like in London? And then just after they're executed, what is execution? What is July like in London? Um, so basically, you know, between the arrest and the execution, it's very much like I said, that suddenly evidence is wheeled out of things like this cart of weapons with Woodville um, coat of arms on is brought as evidence to London as to why, you know, plots are going going off and things like that. Um, and actually, we also have um, some other members of the Woodville family. So um, Thomas Marquis of Dorset, who is Edward um, Elizabeth's oldest son from her first marriage. Um, he's really... Um, I think he's a, quite a more, lot more of a plotter than he put himself for, shall we say. So first, personally, I think if there was a Woodville plot, it was probably Dorset because <laughs> he was he was not he was not very happy. I, he really wanted to be in it. You know, when when Richard um, brought the young prince to London, he really wanted to be in on everything, and I don't think he really liked the fact that he probably wasn't because he was. He was a very similar personality to Edward the Fourth in terms of he enjoyed the, you know, all the womanizing and all this, that, and the other. And I think obviously everybody guessed that that part of Edward's reign was not something that necessarily needed to be repeated in this, um, in these difficult circumstances. So he's very much like throwing his toys out of the pram, going, "Well, why aren't I being involved in <laughs> and things like that?" Um, and you also have. Um, Possibly Edward Woodville, who is um, Anthony's youngest brother, um, uh, possibly running away with tr the treasury as well. Um, so, yes. So I think very much that it's there's other Woodvilles who might have possibly been showing their signs as to who might have been involved in any possible possible plot, really. Um, so all that's going off, really, as well as, like I said, there is still at that particular point... Um, aims to make um, you know preparations for for the for the coronation of the young king which sadly doesn't end up um going to fruition right so when young edward originally comes to london and is put in the tower initially that is not at all a frightening oh no thing because the monarch would typically spend time in the tower before the coronation yes that's right so that's not yet but as time goes on and the coronation is postponed and it, and it's yeah. you know things are starting to change okay so when does um elizabeth woodville who is in sanctuary at this time mm -hmm. find out about the executions and what's happened to her brother do we know when she finds out now this is the thing that i found the most surprising actually because we all get the image that Anthony was probably Elizabeth's favorite sibling and yet we don't have any evidence of what her feelings was at the fact that her brother and her son have just been executed one after the other as well as obviously Thomas Vaughan um so we don't actually know what how she found out what she'd have felt like necessarily or whether or not she was in a, poss in a possible situation to kind of intervene for them in any way. You, this, this is the bit that I found quite difficult to get my head around, that, um, that there's no kind of explanation as to what she necessarily would have felt like, which we kind of do before when... Um, so her father and her brother, um, Richard and John Woodville, had been um, executed without trial, on 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 the orders of Warwick, um, at the at the Battle of Edgecote, 
um you know a, a lot later you know, earlier on and we kind of get the feeling that that really affects the family uh but there doesn't seem to be much as to whether these particular executions did necessarily um but we yeah so that's the bit that i've found quite hard to get my my head around because the only thing that we know post execution is um because we don't even know 100 percent what happened to their bodies either which so it's all completely mysterious <laughs> really but um there is actually evidence in Richard Duke of Gloucester's accounts that he actually did pay for burial for Richard Gray. And we do know that possibly um, Thomas Vaughan, he has at least got a memorial in Westminster Abbey as to whether that means his body says another another matter. I mean, it's entirely possible if, if um, burial has been paid for for Richard Gray. Um, so there's not even a case of, to, you know, any explanation for, for what happened afterwards either. So this is really interesting because, of course, this moment is very, very bad for the Woodvilles. Um, Elizabeth is in sanctuary. Um, the brothers, as you say, fleeing or being accused or this one's executed, you know, so things are bad. And it does turn out that Richard ends up on the throne. I mean, that's the spoiler alert yeah. for everybody, right? So Richard <laughs> takes the throne and, you know, Elizabeth spends quite a bit more time. Um, in sanctuary we don't know what happened to the two princes we won't go there um, and, no. <laughs> and later if we fast forward Elizabeth of York does participate in the next regime after Richard but Anthony let's go back to Anthony that's where we started and that's of course what this book is and you mentioned that it's very mysterious because it's almost like he just disappears yeah so you mentioned at the beginning that your hope was you went to Pontefract. It's so important. This is such an important story. And yet they don't really know when you ask the guides, they don't, they can't really tell his story there. They don't really tell his story there. So you're telling his story. So if we end up with this, we're not really sure what happened. We're not really sure where he was buried. We're not sure how Elizabeth felt about him, who would seem to be her favorite sibling maybe, and certainly the one who was taking care of her son the air for all that time, um, how can you sort of bring us to what you want us to remember about him since his end sort of just disappears? How should, what should we take away from this story about someone who in some cases is lost in some ways to history? Yeah, so I think for me, the easiest way to explain who he was was, um, I've seen quite a few historians explain that Edward IV wanted to create his idea of a new Camelot, um, which I think is quite a fitting um, kind of metaphor, really, that he was very much, you know, he wanted to be King Arthur and, you know, this legendary, legendary king. Um, so I think somebody asked me about this before and I said to me, Anthony is actually his version of Merlin. I said, he's the guy probably doing a lot more of the backseat stuff. It's actually really quite important, but you don't really know what he's doing behind the scenes. Um, but actually, it doesn't mean that it's not important. So, for example, actually, um, this whole period of time is very much uh, seen as, you know, ideas of chivalry and everything are kind of coming back to the fore again, um, which is quite sad because now we just see it as it was probably the last days of chivalry, uh, but they didn't know that. They just wanted to, you know, reignite the ideas because it was worried that a lot of the ideas of chivalry had kind of been been lost a bit, really, obviously, understandably, with a lot of these, um, you know, infighting and this, that and the other. Um, so that's kind of what I see Anthony has in terms of, yes, perhaps he's doing the stuff behind the scenes, but actually it's the really quite important stuff that's actually, it makes what we think of the culture of the Wars of the Roses, really, um, that Anthony's actually quite at the fore of this, even though he doesn't look like he is. I think that's a great way to think about it, because the person in the background often is the one who makes possible what happens sort of in the stage or in the front or that we see. So he was working to create and help bring up this new king 
who could carry on that dynasty and carry on the plans that Edward the Fourth, um, you know, who should have taken better care of himself so it could have lasted, yeah. right? Exactly. <laughs> really it's all his fault. <laughs> part of the problem. I mean, it's you know, but part of the he did a little better job of taking care of himself. Yeah. But he had this vision, and his son was the fulfillment of that vision. And Anthony Woodville was the one he was trusting to prepare the son to sort of stake step in yeah. and take that in into the future and so i really appreciate you're telling us the story of anthony woodville because he often does get lost and the way his story ends with it sort of just almost fading away into the dark you know is yeah. unfortunately yeah. what has happened um and so i really appreciate you bringing it out and cannot wait for the book to appear on my kindle so tell us again when it's coming out and when we can look for it yeah so publication date is the 15th of february so not that long not away that long, yeah. just noticed Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's UK. And I've noticed, um, as uh, you've said, Carol, that it's actually available for pre-order at the moment, but in America, but it's only for the Kindle version at the moment. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I should have mentioned that I pre-ordered the Kindle because that's what's available now. And do you have a US date for the hard? I always like to get both. So yeah. do you have a US date for the hardcover as well? No, I, mean, I haven't been given one at the moment. So at the moment, it's just a Kindle. Uh, that's available for pre-order as far as I know for, for America. Okay. All right. Well, we'll keep checking and, and fill that in. So as yeah. we are um, waiting for that and, and moving forward, um, where can we find you? What social media and what are you working on now? What's in the future? Okay. So, yeah, you can find me on, I still call it Twitter. Well, you know, everybody knows <laughs> I it's too. X now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm, Princess Burton on that. Um, I'm also on Instagram uh, under Voyager of History, which is actually um, my my blog title. So um, you can also find me on on that, uh, which is www.voyagerofhistory.wordpress.com. Um, and I'm also on Facebook as well, which is also under Danielle Burton as well. All right. And I'll have all these links in the show notes. So that's great. Yeah. 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 And what's to come? What are you working on now? Okay, so yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm mainly a history blogger. So for that, I kind of constant, I, how I describe it is I concentrate on uh, lesser known stories, i.e. sort of Anthony Woodville, but from lots of different time periods, really, which is roughly from kind of the 15th century up until uh, late 19th, early 20th roughly <laughs> we'll go with that um okay. so uh, there's lots of blog posts sorted so i think the next one that i'm hoping to do as a proper blog post um i want to look into um charles dickens and a train crash he was um involved in um which not a lot of people necessarily know um and that slightly put him off trains afterwards <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well that's wonderful and some of these lesser known stories we find out are so important to Definitely. really grasp how these things happen how does this turn out this way and it's the lesser known stories that really make the yeah thing happen. that's actually what I've been working on so I, um, I also do quite a few history talks based on things that I've done um, research wise um, and actually the one that I'm doing um, later at the end of February is actually on um, a woman called Margaret Cavendish Mm -hmm. uh, who is Duchess of Newcastle that um she's been a bit of a history hero of mine since I volunteered for um at my local English heritage site at Falsover Castle um and I've just pretty much loved her since then to be honest um because actually she was a very modern woman considering she was living in in uh, you know 1600s um, <laughs> so she she was actually um very interested in science she was a microscope she wrote about over 20 different things in their life um as well so I've been um, so that's my next talk that I'm doing is explaining why um yeah so she's been named Mad Madge because of all of the exciting things that she did and I but as it turned out I've just found out that it was actually only the Victorians that called her that so oh, the, those Victorians <laughs> well that's wonderful yeah. so we'll have if, if you can send me that we'll have that a link to that too in the show notes yeah. so um just let people know right. well 
Thank you so much. This has been such a treat to learn about somebody Great, we didn't you. know very well, don't know a lot about, but now we really can see all those pieces of that time Thanks. period all fit together. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone you. for joining us. It's been a treat. I'll have all the information. We're counting down the days till your book. And we'll all continue here to learn about lesser known stories like you say, and all other kinds of royals, rebels, and romantics in history. So thanks so much, everybody. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Royals, Rebels, and Romantic. I really appreciate your spending some time with us. If you would subscribe wherever you are on listening or on YouTube, leave a rating and maybe share with a friend. And please plan to join us next time as we keep shaking up history together. Mm -hmm.